Economic students are not famous for their cooperative behavior. And if you're an econ instructor, chances are you yourself were an econ student. I was a student when this paper was written. I remember the term. I was taking intermediate microeconomics with Juan Carlos Velauste y Goya. And he applied the infamous experiment of public goods to us. I remember feeling so proud of myself because I was so smart. I kept all the benefits from my individual account and all the benefits from the public good provided by those students who naively decided to cooperate. Add a few more weeks and I needed their help to study for the finals. Add a few more months and I needed their help and the help from professors and staff to help me write a thesis. Add a few more years and I was facing the worst deforestation spring in Mexico and we needed the cooperation of community leaders, NGOs, and lots of people from the federal and local government to help us. Now, going back to teaching, cooperation is good for learning. That's what the literature in pedagogy says. Even the literature in economics says so. In this talk, I share the challenge I faced in the implementation of a cooperative learning technique in a managerial economics course. So in regards to cooperation, there are three challenges to consider. The free writing or uneven contribution of the different participants, which can result in an unfair distribution of the load. The student absences or the possibility that some student quits or ghosts the other members of the teams. And the problem is that they don't get to fully participate and learn from the experience. Three, the mindset that econ students are only focused on their individual gain, which may lead to a lack of participation or to a strategic behavior where you rely on the strongest student to do all the work. To address these challenges, I use the following strategies for incorporating cooperative learning through jigsaw puzzles in the economics classroom. So first, groups were formed trying to ensure a balanced distribution of skills and abilities. This can reduce the likelihood of uneven contributions and ensure that each student has a role to play in the group. We worked with business case studies created by Sage and a couple by the New York Times. So each student had an area, was assigned an area of expertise. There will be a pricing expert, a vertical integration expert, a joint production expert, and a net present value expert. In terms of the timing, let me show you my schedule. I begin the group project after the midterm. By then, I already have grades, and I also know my students a bit better. So think about an athletic team. The weakest students are in the middle, the strongest student finishes, and the medium student begins. This way, I have a high probability of having at least a pricing strategy and a net present value analysis of such strategy. In my online course, students meet asynchronously in a discussion board. Now, for in-person projects, some experts suggest to make groups based on academic skills and also based on the time of the week when they can meet. So parents who need to wait for their kids to go to bed can meet uh, in the evenings while people who work full time can work in Saturdays and so on. This way the problem of meeting is solved, right? Well, two, clear expectations were communicated to students regarding their individual and their group responsibilities. This can help motivate students to contribute equally and hold each other accountable. To make sure that everyone knows what each person should do, I use redundancy a lot. Each team has a page with a whole case study and the instructions. In person, you can use a handout uh, with the role and expectations of each team member. And then each, the week that we study pricing, I send a reminder of what everybody needs to do. And there are several places where they can find what they need to do. The original setting of the jigsaw puzzle is that students meet with their experts, 16 pricing experts meet then 16 vertical integration experts meet, and then they divide and they create with their own team their case study. Well, it didn't work in my case because we have very few interactions, so students started developing a relationship in these teams. 
and then it was very hard to cut the relationship and start a new relationship with the team that they were supposed to turn in their final case study. So what I did is that I put the same team from the beginning and everybody works in the pricing strategy, everybody works in the vertical integration strategy, and then everybody works in the production strategy, and finally everybody contributes to the net present value calculation. Well, this way they develop a relationship, they set their own pace, and they get used to interacting to one, with one another. Now, to be absolutely transparent about grades, I have a grading rubric to assess both the individual and the group contribution, and they can provide students with a clear understanding of how their, wor their work will be evaluated and give them incentives to do what they have to do. Finally, assume good intentions and let them know you care. First of all, even if I don't have the time to grade, I go into each of these 16 discussion boards and make sure that people are showing up. If people are not there, then I tell students that I see, I notice, and they are not talking to the void. These are some weekly messages that I shared in the weeks when students were working in groups. But I also remind them about assuming good intentions. Missing students have a lot of other things going on in their life right now. There was never a student who didn't participate just because they didn't want to. One student had an accident, and a student had to travel abroad for a funeral, a student had a dad who had a stroke, and so on and so forth. And students are incredibly forgiving. They always embrace that student who wants to come back, and they don't mind helping out. So what happened? In the end, in my book, it was a success. And what does success look like? Well, I had 64 students, and I had 16 case studies uploaded. Out of those 16 teams, seven of them kept their four members and participated together. Seven of them had only three members, and two of them had only two members. I lost 11 of 64 students, and that's a success. This is an asynchronous online course. Now, success also means that you observe the learning happening there in front of your eyes. Success means that you have a tangible result that wouldn't have happened if it was only an individual assignment. Success means that economic students talk to each other and made compromises and work together to build consensus and share the responsibility of the work. So, which other settings do you think you could find to make students work in groups and collaborate and cooperate and practice solving problems as they will do in the real world. Hello, uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present today our work on group work as assessments. Uh, our motivation for this uh, project uh, started because many of the big literature mentioning the advantages of uh, group work. We know that it enhances cooperation, and in many cases, depending on the, the, the specific structure, it enhances also collaboration, like, for example, in team-based learning. Um, we know that it fosters uh, the sense of belonging as students uh, start uh, socializing and uh, making friends uh, through the process of working in a group. And that can also have implications for their um, um, relationship outside the classroom and outside the campus. Um, it also enhances uh, students' transferable skills, especially on communication and negotiation, which are very important, increasingly important employability skills. And it, it, we know it that also promotes problem-based learning, uh, among other uh, advantages that group work uh, might have. Um, however, we know that group work uh, has some challenges. Uh, for an example, in the case of um, the recent pandemic, when uh, uh, more courses went 
uh, towards distance learning. It, it seemed to be a bit difficult. So we have evidence that it was a little bit difficult to keep students' contribution, to uh, keep students engaging with their group work, uh, talking to their peers and arranging um, all, all the meetings. Um, also, there are some more practical challenges on the type of the tasks, uh, what should be the specific tasks, um, if there is enough time uh, in a course to run the group work um, as it should be. And then there are also um, challenges that have to do with, with incentives. So um, we have evidence that uh, students might be, some students might be free riding, or there are issues of social loafing, and lately also cyber loafing. Um, and, and those are well documented in the literature. So this is a reason we think that we need to dig a little bit more on group work as assessment. And because apart from being uh, a useful assessment tool, um, actually helps in creating the right incentives probably to avoid uh, these issues of free riding or social loafing uh, that we see uh, in some cases in some cases so it will actually um, the assessment will create extreme motivations for students to participate and uh, contribute and as also students themselves uh, have said it's important that the group work is part of the final grade assessment because it creates the correct uh, incentives for contribution also nowadays with uh, the challenges that um, AI might bring in our assessment methods, group work might be a useful alternative method of assessment to mitigate some of the concerns uh, that AI brings. As an example, it could be that um, group work presentations uh, are uh, helpful um, tools and structure of assessment towards that direction. So, what is our first objective with this project is to understand how do modules that incorporate various amounts of group work contribute to a differential average in overall assessment compared to modules without group work. So we want to kind of have an objective measure of learning outcomes. And we think it's interesting because it will help us understand how students are performing in different modules with uh, group work and whether certain assessment types might actually create deviations in this objective uh, outcome beyond actually any effect that might be there by construction of the group work assessment per se. So, Till now, we have, uh, some, uh, we have some data on average grade uh, for the last um, two academic years. And uh, those are coming from 87 uh, undergraduate modules, but um, uh, we are actually increasing our sample at the moment. So this is a, a preliminary analysis on the data that we have, but we have already seen some interesting patterns that are emerging from, uh, from this data. Um, so, uh, proportionally, the, the biggest amount of uh, modules with group work come from first year courses, and then third year courses, and at the end, the second year courses. And in our sample, uh, we have a, a larger in general proportion of third year courses because of the elective courses for the last year of studies. And when we actually uh, try to see the, the overall average grades and median grades and split it uh, between group work and no group work, meaning that uh, comparing the modules that have a group work component to the modules that they don't have. And when we say group work component, we mean uh, summative assessments. We actually see that um, the modules with group work have slightly um, lower median averages and median compared to the modules without group work. And if we also uh, compare the courses by level of study, so first year, second year, and third year, what we see is that 
the courses in the first year and in the second year, they follow more or less the same pattern, the overall pattern. So the averages with group work are uh, seem to be lower. Uh, and however, for the third year, we see that these differences are not uh, that pronounced. So actually we see that the median average and the median uh, of the median grade for the third year courses are more or less the same with and without group work. Um, then uh, we wanted to understand if there is any such pattern emerging also uh, due to the different intensity of group work. So what happens if a module has more than one uh, group work assessment? Um, and we see that it seems that modules with two group work assessments have um, lower median average and median grades compared to the ones with one group work and then them compared with the ones without group work. So it, it seems um, that intensity plays a role and affects uh, slightly differentially the overall final outcomes. Um, th uh, then we actually um, categorized the sample in discursive modules, uh, mixed modules and quantitative modules, where discursive are mainly modules like history of economic thought or economic history. Mixed are classified as the majority of economics courses. Uh, like micro, macro economics of first year. And quantitative are, are the ones that they have as main goal to teach the quantitative skills like maths or, or stats, for an example. And what we see is that when we compare the modules with group work uh, to the modules without group work, for the discursive courses, the, the comparison uh, the differences are not that high. Actually, uh, the median grades are a little bit lower, but uh, not as pronounced. Um, for the mixed courses, the same. They are more or less the same. While for the quantitative courses, however, we see quite a big difference between the modules without group work and the modules with group work. We see also that in general, there are uh, different uh, distributions um, between, uh, between these modules. So we have run uh, some uh, correlation analysis that for uh, the lack uh, of time, I will, I will skip it, but we're very happy to discuss it in, in the discussion uh, chat. Um, but we have actually seen that our preliminary, preliminary analysis shows that modules with group work indeed have differential averages of overall marks compared to modules without group work. And as this is a work in progress, our next step is to actually extend our sample, so to be able to extend our analysis beyond the first shock of the pandemic to understand the changing in the frequency and the nature of group work and also understand if the effect, these differential effects that group work modules seem to have on the overall uh, average grade on the uh, um, on the learning outcomes uh, are different before and after the pandemic. Uh, currently, we have data for 2019-2020, but due to the disruption on the exam period um, in, in that academic year, uh, we need to to uh, analyze this data much more to have uh, a conclusive idea. And then we also want to see if students perform better or worse in any specific type of group work. So we want to classify different types of group works. And we also want to understand in more detail how the, this intensity of group work uh, plays a role in the overall assessment and how the weights of these assessments in the overall grade uh, might create differential effects. Um, uh, at the end, we would like also to explore how instructors decide on the kind of group work they want to implement and to see if they actually have in mind that group work components, uh, summative components in a course 
might have some differential effects on the overall uh, marks uh, of, of these courses. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I am Patty Reeder, Assistant Professor of the Economics Department at the University of Connecticut. Today, I'm going to present you an assignment that I created not so long ago that I call Group Challenge. Hopefully, it will be useful to some of you. So it was motivated by the fact that, as many of you know, <clears throat> college students do not know how to study well for the exam. Um, they typically go through lecture notes in a very passive manner and believe that's enough. Um, there's plenty of evidence about this. And of course, this does not apply to every student, but I'm talking about the average student in the university, in a university like the University of Connecticut. And I believe it applies to many other college students in the world. Um, so in a typical course, we have lectures and we have homework and, and exams, right? But I think that, that this combination of lecture and homework is, is good, but it's incomplete uh, to help students to be well prepared for the exam. Um, lectures are the first exposure to the material and it might seem easier than it actually is when a professor solves an exercise on the board. I tell my students that it's like when they watch a TikTok or YouTube um, dance moves and they think, oh, I can do that too, at least I say that, and then I try and I can't. And, and it, you realize that it, it's much more difficult than it looks when you actually try it. The problem is that they do not try to do them themselves. Um, so they, they should do it with the homework, right? But the homework are um, typically not very difficult. And I don't think it should be because it's the first time they're going to apply what they have learned. Um, and also the stakes are low, the environment is not ideal, they typically do it, you know, watching TV or, I mean, they don't watch TV anymore, but Netflix um, or, <clears throat> you know, or, or just not paying enough attention. Um, and so some students, the ideal students, will do the homework and before the exam will practice again, like in a more exam-like environment, you know. Um, using more uh, difficult exercise, etc. But many students don't, don't do that. So my proposal is these group challenges that are assignments with few but challenging questions um, in groups, in class. They're graded They're typically one week before the exams. And in the next class, just before uh, the exam, we have a review of the group challenge, of the difficulties of it, and uh, et cetera. <clears throat> so why do I make it challenging? I do it to encourage students to think deeply on, on the topics, um, to help them identify what they know, but especially what they don't know, and uh, to scare them a little bit and to study harder for the exam. Um, I grade it to increase the stakes of the group challenge and that everybody comes and, and, and take, the, and, and take the, the group challenge. But I don't, it doesn't wait that much because I still want them to understand or to take this more as a learning uh, exercise than as an assessment. And that's why I do it one week before the final. And then after group challenge, they still have one, one week to study for both the midterm and the final. <clears throat> I make it in class to make sure that they do the work in the right setting, like you know, no internet, no distraction, it's time constraint. It also allows me to get feedback. I go around, I see what they're doing, I see what the difficulties, I guide them a little bit without giving them the answer. Um, and also because in this way, it's easier for them to work in groups. And I make this in groups to allow them to collaborate and learn from each other. Um, 
it also reduces the anxiety because as, as I told you, these exams are challenging. And so um, if they would be alone, they might, at home, they might just, you know, get frustrated and stop working on them, or it might give them some anxiety that they don't know anything, etc. But by making it in groups, they, they share the anxieties. And also, um, if they don't know, the, uh, one of them might know. And, and also, I forgot to mention, the groups, I always try to make them in a way that the best students are um, separated so that in each group of typically four students there is at least one student that is really good and um, so that in other words the groups are balanced in terms of typically the, the results in the midterm and uh, sorry in the first midterm because I have two midterms and one final um, <clears throat> or in terms of GPA um, the other advantage of making it uh, in groups is that I have fewer assignments to grade and that allows me to make uh, open-ended questions. And so I can see also the process, what they did to try to solve it, where was the mistake, etc. It's important to highlight that this is not, um, this is not supposed to be like very similar to the exam. So it's not helpful for them because they're just going to have the same type of uh, questions. Um, the questions are in the final and in the midterm are multiple choice and their times are typically, in the exams they typically have 30 questions. Here you only have 10 questions at most and they're open-ended and they're more difficult. So they're really different. They are not meant to be a practice for multiple choice type of exam is a practice of the topics. Um, <clears throat> and I don't even cover all the topics because it's impossible in 10 questions. So I, it's really more about like, how do I have to learn? How, how do I approach? What do I really know? What, what, what I don't know? Um, so these are the evaluations from the students. Um, this is um, this is not a subsample of students. These are all my students from one class uh, from the last uh, my intermediate microeconomic class um, that I have 23 students. So before the final, I asked them to answer just this one question and then answer the final, so that I make sure that I had the answer from everybody. Um, as you can see. Everybody agree that the group challenge helps students to learn more effectively. I was I was surprised to be honest. I knew that a lot of students like it, but I didn't know it was going to be um, so generalized. And um, about seventy four percent strongly agree with the fact that group challenge helped them learn more effectively. I <clears throat> I I'm going to run the same survey in my other courses in the future. And um, and I also incorporated a question like this in the student of, oh, this was anonymous, of course. I also included um, a question like this in the student evaluation of teaching. Um, and the result was the same. Everybody said yes. Um, and that was in all my courses. But there, I didn't have the four options. I, it was just a yes or no question. Okay, so some of the comments that I received. This is very interesting because this was um, this was from the question that was not directed to to a group challenge. It was what was the most positive aspect of the way in which instructor thought this course, and many students mentioned the group challenge. So um, so that was very encouraging. Um, and so the next steps would be to estimate maybe through a randomized control trial effects on scores and on other outcomes such as interest in economics, maybe heterogeneous effect, and I'm open to any suggestion you may have. Thank you.